Um, so let's talk about audiences. Um, and again, as, as, as far as I know, um, I don't think anybody's doing any um, audience research uh, for assessments one or three. Although saying that, you never know. Um, you might uh, decide to do something for your dissertation about audiences. And it's certainly a, a, a vibrant area of, of, of research and uh, quite quite satisfying. I've not done a lot myself actually. I've touched on it in my PhD and in my book uh, but I've never really done a lot uh, of sort of original audience research. I've read a lot about it but never actually done uh, anything uh, myself. However, I'm, I'm relatively knowledgeable and, uh, and uh, the, the important thing about this module is called theories and approaches. So even though you might not be doing audience research it's important that I give you a, a, a head start on, on what it's all about and uh, how to do it. So let, let's just talk and, may, and I apologize if you've done this in other modules but let me let me just give you a quick definition of what an audience when we when we when people say audience generally speaking so when my mum says it my mates say it my friends say it so people who are not involved in media research when they say audience you, you generally mean like the photograph there on slide 32 uh, you, you generally think of, of, a, of a bunch of people who are either watching a concert or a festival or watching a play or a movie or something. But audiences is, um, in academic terms, is a more generic term. So as Crotu and Hoynes, who are two American uh, uh, academics at the top there, they say an audience, uh, audiences are the recipients of a form of external stimulus, whether it's a movie, a song, a TV program, a website, a magazine, it can be anything, anything in the media, basically, that elicit an observable response. So that's really important, that last bit. So there's a response. It might be shock horror, it might be laughter, it might be uh, tears, it might be jumping up and down with glee, or it might just be a raised eyebrow. Or it might be, hmm, somebody says, hmm, that's interesting. So audiences, they have to respond. It's not, so it's not just, a, you know, a, a throwing information at a brick wall. You know, there is a, 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 some kind of observable response. It makes people think or it excites people or it depresses people or it angers people or whatever it might be. So at the bottom, audiences are not just, as you see there in the photograph, they are also readers, people who read newspapers, the viewers of television programmes or of movies or whatever it might be, listeners of radio programmes, podcasts and browsers on uh, on websites. So that, that's when we talk in academia about audiences, our definition is broader than the, the standard everyday definition of audiences. Now the thing about audiences, <coughs> and if you read any academic books about audiences, this is one of the first things that they'll tell you, is that audiences are subdivided. So don't think about an audience as being a homogenous whole. So all 66 million people in the UK, that's one audience, and they all behave in the same way, and they all react in the same way. It's complete nonsense, as you'll find out later. And the reason is, is that audiences can be subdivided. So, and you can subdivide audiences, and you can you can detect different audiences with a little bit of a little bit of investigation. So, one way that you can tell the characteristics of an audience is is language and images. I think we spoke about this a few weeks ago. I think, as I remember, if you read an article and you notice that the language is really simple and the vocabulary is really limited, you can generally assume that the audience for that material is. Uh, has pretty low education and I'm not being rude here uh, but some people don't have much education whether it's their own fault or society's fault or the educational system's fault it doesn't really matter but there are different levels of education and journalists will use the language that's appropriate for their perceived audience so if the language is really simple um, you know simple words um, uh, and uh, short sentences for example that tends to be a, assume a, a relatively low education of, of the reader. Um, conversely, if, if you read um, some um, um, content which is uh, has sort of artistic and abstract photos, um, that suggests that the audience is quite educated and quite, and I put it in speech marks, cultured. So I put it in speech marks, the general word for culture is somebody who likes architecture and ballet and Shakespeare and all that, but there is culture at all different levels of society. So football is a culture, you know, soap operas uh, represent a type of culture. 
uh, you know, programs like what's that awful one, Love Island, you know, that that is a type of culture, even though people will disagree that it's uh, cultured in any way whatsoever. It's not cultured in the traditional sense because it's not Shakespeare, it's not ballet, it's not fine art, but it is culture. It's 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 what you might call popular culture. So you can tell audience by looking at the language and the images, uh, the subject matter is a bit of a giveaway. So again, abstract concepts, um, abstract concepts like human rights, um, you know, that's that's quite, I mean, we all know what it means, but it's not something you can touch and feel. Human rights is an abstract concept. So if a journalism is talking about human rights, typically that's aimed at a more educated uh, audience. Uh, international news, youngsters typically aren't really interested in international news. So if you see a magazine with a lot of international news, it's probably aimed at an educated older audience people of my generation take more interest in international news conversely trivial i put it in speech marks again uh, for some people it's not trivial but uh, trivial sort of chatty sort of stuff as one of my colleagues at another university called it fluffy journalism you know journalism about you know you know a cat stuck up a tree you know and uh, i don't know um, sort of family reunions and all that all that sort of positive stuff that makes us glad to be alive um uh, typically that's aimed at, dare I say, sort of um, um, lower educated people. I mean, everybody loves a, a good sob story. Uh, but if that's all the magazine, the chat magazines, Hello, OK magazine, things like that, um, the, typically education is, is pretty low. And also um, youth, you know, so young people are more interested in music and sport and fashion and all that sort of stuff. And then the, there's also what you call gendered. Uh, so magazines, sometimes gendered, women's health, it's obvious what that's all about, right? So that's directed very much at women. Uh, Top Gear magazine, which is all about, you know, cars. Uh, it's typically, typically the, the readership is male, but obviously some women read it as well. And it's aimed at a certain age group and so on. So, so you, you do have what's called gendered content as well. So some magazines, some pro TV programs, some audiences are predominantly male, some are predominantly female, some are predominantly young, some are predominantly not well educated. And then you have political position. Think about the politics of a publication. That's a different audience. The Daily Mail readership is a different audience to the Guardian readership. Uh, they're both interested in the news, but the Daily Mail tends to look at it from the right wing. The Guardian tends to look at it from the left wing. Think about the political compass here, what we did in week six. And, and also, more than anything else, and I'll come on to this in a bit more detail in a moment, but if you really want to know the audience of a publication or a TV programme, speak to the advertising department, because they do loads of research behind the scenes trying to figure out who it is that watches or their programme or listens uh, to their radio station or whatever it might be. So, And, and they're quite good at it. They're, they're usually, you know, obviously, because a lot of money is involved, um, so expensive and stylish products, if you read a newspaper and there's expensive and stylish products, that says to you that the audience is relatively wealthy and relatively cultured in speech marks again. Uh, conversely, cheap products um, in a magazine or a newspaper um, suggests a relatively low income. And dare I say by extension, relatively low education as well. I'm not saying these in pejorative ways, it's just a fact of life. Some people as we found out last week, only half of the population in the UK does have a university degree. So half the population in the UK has a degree, half doesn't. I'm not saying that degree perfectly correlates with education and intellect, but it's moving in that, that direction. So key point on this slide, audiences are subdivided, subdivided. There's no such thing as a homogenous single audience. Now, if you want an example of that, uh, slide 34, even within organizations there are different audiences so the bbc massive news organization biggest one in the uk so it's an exception but you get the idea here so some of you might be familiar with this um, this uh, this web page called newsbeat so newsbeat is the news for the younger generation so if you look at the stories that they choose it's typically music sport fashion <clears throat> all the sort of stuff that 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 typically interests um, teenagers and young adults. So that's news for a young audience. Slide 34. Slide 35, here is the standard BBC news website which I look at every day. So this is for a general audience. Look at the stories, it's not just fashion, sport, music, uh, celebrity now. It's moved on to politics, international issues, um, Covid obviously, American election, all that sort of stuff. So it's a general audience general subjects 
uh, done in, to, to quite a high standard of, uh, uh, if you look at the language, it, it's quite, it's not challenging, but it, it's, it, it's relatively advanced. And then slide 36, the BBC also provides news programmes for what's called specialist audiences. So people who are really interested in politics and have a lot of knowledge about politics. So if you look at the Newsnight website and you look at Newsnight, the TV programme, which is on, I think, Monday through Thursday, about 10.30 on BBC Two, that, that has politicians on there talking typically about abstract concepts in a very detailed and intelligent and articulate way. So even within the BBC, you have at least three different audiences for their news products. You have the newsbeat audience, the young people, you have the middle general audience, and then you have the specialist audience as well. So hopefully that demonstrates in vivid detail what I mean by um, basically segmented um, audiences. <coughs> and another way, <coughs> as well as education and age and so on, another way that audience, audiences are um, divided is in, in terms of uh, socio-economic class. Now we don't have a huge amount of time to go through this but I think it's worthwhile just explaining um, for those of you who don't know. I don't know how many of you have actually learned this in the past um, but all all societies are divided and, it, and I've been doing quite a lot of work on this recently for my next book um, about class and I've read a lot of books about class and interviewed people about class and it's interesting that my international friends see class in a different way to how we see it in the UK. So I apologise if you're from another culture, but this is basically the, the, the British way of doing it. And I think it's similar in the States and other, other um, uh, Western countries as well. So essentially, this is the traditional way of doing it. There are six socio-economic classes. On the left-hand side there, you've got A, B. So whoever's done this, they've put the two together. A and B, they've squeezed together. Uh, and then you've got C1, C2, and then D and E. And again, D and E have been squeezed together. So you'll notice that A, B, these are the higher and intermediate managerial administrative professional occupations. So me, university lecturer, officially, I'm in class B. Class A is like the landed gentry, the lords and ladies, the elite, the royal family. I guess celebrities and footballers who earn inordinate amounts of money. People who work in the city who earn, earn okay, they, they, I, in my opinion, they don't earn it. They get paid it. It's not the same as earning it. They get paid seven-figure sums for basically buying and selling money. Okay, so that's A's and B's. And that's 22% of the population. And then you've got C1, which is supervisory, clerical, junior managerial, administrative, professional occupations. Um, so typically people who work in offices, if you work in admin, you're C1. And again, that well, that accounts for about a third of the population, 30%. Skilled manual occupations, people who work in the factory, bricklayers, plasterers. Uh, and if you've ever seen those people work, you'll be amazed by their skill. So even though they get their hands dirty every day, they're doing things that I could never learn to do in, in 100 years. Just amazing. Carpenters, plumbers, hairdressers, um, people like that. So that's skilled manual. And then you've got D's and E's who are semi-skilled, unskilled, so van drivers, care assistants. Um, they're all incredibly valuable members of society, as we know, because of COVID. Uh, but they do tend to get paid a lot less and typically their educational levels uh, are typically not as high as, as, as the other. So that's basically how British society is, 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 is broken down. Um, so 22% in A's and B's, 30% in C1's, 21% uh, or thereabouts C2 and then D's and E's accounting for the rest. So advertisers do are interested in these social classes for the simple reason that the higher up that that scale you go the more money people have to spend so obviously people advertisers ideally want to attract um, um the people who um, earn the most money so let, let me just show you because i know how much you love data folks slide number 38 and i'm going to just give you a couple of minutes just to have a look at this so this is from a, a, a magazine called Broadcast Magazine. Broadcast Magazine, as the name suggests, is a magazine for the broadcast industry. And one of every week, it has a table like this that shows the audiences of various TV channels. So on the left-hand side, it says BBC One, ITV, BBC Two, etc., all the way down. So there are numerous, what, about 20 TV channels that you probably recognise. Um, and what it shows you is how much what their audience is made of. So it looks at gender and it looks at class. On the right hand side I put the socio-economic classes to remind you what they are. So just spend a couple of minutes um, looking at those that data 
And then um, let's have a bit of audience participation for the first time today. Tell me what stands out for you. So really, at MA level, folks, you should be able to look at a bunch of data like this and start making intelligent comments. This is called critical thinking. So I'll give you a couple of minutes. So anybody, tell me what you've discovered. What, what does it tell you? The, the, I find this personally very enlightening, this sort of stuff. Anybody? Has anybody spotted anything interesting? Is it all too much? Is it like too much data and you're completely drowning in it and you're, you can't see a damn thing? I'll take that as a yes. Right, let's move on. Let's move on. Because I realise that data isn't something which which uh, which uh, motivates you a lot. But personally, maybe it's just me, but I think data is fascinating. Right, go to slide number um, 39. 39. And what I've done here is highlighted certain things. So, top left, I've written the word social classes social classes so the third column says adults a b c one profile for um, percentage what that shows you is the proportion of that channel's audience that falls into a b and c one so ideally if you want to appeal to a to a, a wealthy audience you need a high number here so what this says is 47 percent of the people who watch bbc one are in those top three social groups 47 percent if you look down the list, look at the other end of the spectrum, what's the lowest number? Uh, where are we? Film 4, no, ITV2, 31%. So only 31% of ITV2 are in those three social groups. So you'll see that the social socioeconomic class, there is a disparity across the channels. And some channels, they do purposefully aim at lower social class because there is a market there. So that's social class. Um, second point, right at the bottom, I put BBC3, a failure question mark. Now, if you look at BBC3, for those of you who don't know, is a TV channel. It was introduced about 10, 15 years ago. And its job, its, its stated purpose is appeal to y the young generation, teenagers, young adults like, like you. Um, and what this says here is it's got 3.2% of total audience of 16 to 34 so that's why i'm asking whether it's a failure it's its whole purpose in life is to appeal to that audience but only three percent of people actually watch it so that's a question whether it's a failure or not if it's 30 percent, it'll be a success but it's only three percent uh, top right i've written the word female preferences and if you look at the data uh, you'll notice that itv3 has got quite a high uh, proportion of female audience so 65% of its audience 64.85 to be precise is female uh, and uh, the other 35% is male so that's pretty and as we know in the UK it's pretty much 50 50 male and female so ITV3 has more female proportionally more female viewers than male look at Sky Sports male preferences Sky Sports 73% 72.79% 72 of Sky Sports viewers are male 27.21 are female so you'll notice there there's the gender there's the gender difference so some odd, um, channels are aiming at men predominantly other channels are aiming at females predominantly uh, and uh, some channels are aiming at young people like bbc3 and other channels are seen to be more successful with the a b and c1 social groups so the key point here even though i know that you're not particularly comfortable or excited or animated about numbers uh, to me they're fascinating they reveal a hell of a lot and i urge you all to engage with numbers because if you don't you're only basically you know it's only like reading half the book really if you don't engage with numbers folks then you're, you're missing half of the story when it comes to media research and it's not as scary as it looks and as i said before you've all got gcse maths so you know what you're doing so that's audience measurement in terms of the numbers uh, next slide number 40 as i hinted at before if you want to know audience characteristics the people to really ask are the advertising department because they invest huge amounts of time money resources in trying to understand who the people are that consume their product and the way they do it they do it in two ways one is surveys uh, where literally they ask people about age their income their social groups their likes their leisure time etc etc key point about surveys and i'll touch on this 
a little bit more in a moment, is that you need large numbers to be valid. So if you just go and ask your mates, five, six people, that's not a valid survey. Um, you have to ask many more than that. And the other way they do it, um, which is represented by the photograph on the right, uh, is by what's called focus groups. So a focus groups, as the, as the photograph shows, is a small group of people, typically sitting around a table in, or in comfortable armchairs, sometimes with a glass of wine even, which makes people a little bit more expressive, um, and they are asked questions by uh, what, what's called somebody called a, a moderator. So somebody who represents the company will sit in there and ask them questions about their perceptions, their beliefs, their thoughts, their ideas. And it's focus groups are really good to understand how people's minds operate, how they think, how they, um, how they work things out, how they come to decisions. Uh, and so on. So essentially it's small groups discussing issues and you get a really good um, in-depth knowledge as I said of people's thought processes uh, and so on. I always find them a, a bit spooky like this one here it shows the group in, in a room and then there's it's like one of those awful movies isn't it you've got like a, a sort of one-way mirror I think it's called and then you've got a group of people maybe working for the BBC or Channel 4 the executives who are actually watching these uh, people in their discussion. Um, so Taylor's talking, asking earlier on about ethics, and I always wonder about the ethics of that. I guess they tell the participants that they're being watched, because it would be really spooky and freaky if they didn't tell them that. Um, so anyway, so this is what advertisers use to find out how the public thinks and, and what they believe and what their preferences are. Surveys and focus groups. Two different approaches, uh, but they are essentially doing a, a very similar thing. Um, so talking about advertisers and audiences, really, really important, particularly in commercial television. So the BBC is separate from this because it's not a commercial operation, but every other TV, uh, every other TV channel, and now my phone is ringing. So uh, it's all about audiences, advertisers, finance and, and money and so on. Uh, so, and th this is, I did this a few, a few years ago um, I, to try and illustrate to my class about advertisers. And... Um, uh, and I must admit, at the time, I wasn't watching these two programmes. For the British people in the class, you probably recognise uh, these two programmes. Uh, for the benefit of everybody else, The Only Way is Essex is, is one of those kind of, uh, what they call, they're called, kind of called document, what are they called? Fly on the wall type documentaries. So they're, they're, they're kind of real people in the real world, but they're kind of dramatised slightly. Um, and it's young people in Essex being fashionable, dating each other, all the drama. It's like a soap opera, basically, but in kind of real life. And the Jeremy Kyle show was, past tense, a program that is it's like a conflict program. So, you know, a man and a woman come together on the stage with an audience and Jeremy Kyle is, is, the, is the presenter. And he says, well, she said that you've been cheating and he says he's not and, you know, and all that sort of stuff. So it's like a sort of conflict program. So as you can probably guess, they're probably, they're not really, we're not dealing abstract concepts here, folks. We're not dealing with sort of um, culture in the, in, the, in the true sense. So these are quite, dare I say, down market programs. And what amused me a few years ago when I was accidentally watching them is I made a note of the advertisers who actually sponsors the programme. So this tells you about the audience. So the advertisers have done their research, they know who the audience is, they then say like, this is our audience, they tell advertisers and advertisers make a bid to come along and uh, advertise their products. So the only way is Essex, I noticed a few years ago, is advertised by Zavirax, which is um, um, cream for cold sores. Now, I'm not saying that everybody who watches The Only Way is Essex has cold sores, but clearly the people at Zavirax believe that that is the sort of people that they need to be advertising to. I'm not quite sure what that says in terms of, uh, in terms of the dynamics of the audience. But anyway, Zavirax sponsored The Only Way is Essex, uh, and uh, Jeremy Carr's show was sponsored by Foxy Bingo which is like an online bingo game. So again, that tells you something about the audience. So basically, Jeremy Kyle viewers, they like bingo, and the only way is Essex viewers are the sorts of people who might possibly need Zavirax. So moving on, slide 43. Uh, if you want more audience data, and it's, I find, like I said, I find it absolutely fascinating. 
um, this to, to understand who watches what. And don't forget, you know, human beings are unpredictable. So it, th there is no program in history where 100% of 16 year olds watch a certain program and they all believe the same thing. It doesn't work like that. You sometimes get programs directed at young people that old people watch. You know, or you watch programs, you know, Sky Sports, you know, people say, you know, it's, it's, it's um, what, three quarters male, the audience, but plenty of women still watch. It doesn't mean that women aren't included, it doesn't mean women aren't allowed, but it just means that Sky Sports in general appeals to men more than, more than to women. Uh, so more audience data, Ofcom, really, really, um, uh, uh, loads and loads of information there. And Ofcom, as you know, is the broadcast and online regulator. Um, the ABC Audit Bureau of Circulations, if you want to know about newspaper readership, it's all there. And uh, BARB, British Audit Research Bureau, or whatever it stands for. But the, essentially that's like the ABC, but for broadcast. And these organisations produce regular detailed reports uh, about the, the audiences and about the media in general. Okay, so that's audiences. Um, yes, and as with interviews, just be aware that audience research is deceptively hard work. So don't think that it's just a question of sitting down and chatting to people about their viewing habits. Um, if you want to do audience research, the first step, slide number 45, is, is to ask yourself and do it with your supervisor. What do you actually want to find out? Do you want to find out about audience what they believe or what they consume or who they are in terms of gender, age and beliefs and all that sort of stuff? Or do you want to find out about what they think about the content? So it all depends which method, I come back to my point right at the beginning of the show today, the method depends on what you actually want to find out. Don't just do it as a matter of casual interest uh, because time is precious and you need all the time you can get. So slide number 46. You've seen this one before. I've just added a bit more detail. So, if you want to um, do, so if you do want to do audience research and you've got a clear idea of what you want to do, the options are interviews, surveys, focus groups, and ethnographies. Let me just cancel out ethnographies because that doesn't really uh, apply for audiences. So, you've either got focus groups. I touched on those on slide 39 and also interviews which we've already done so the interviews they apply to if you're interviewing practitioners or if you're interviewing audience members the same principles apply it's all about preparation so let me just talk about the one that's conspicuously conspicuously doesn't have a big arrow with a yellow label surveys now surveys and opinion polls they are really useful and i find them absolutely fascinating because it's data it's numbers and it's a snapshot of humanity um, but with surveys and opinion polls, the key words are the two at the bottom. Just be really, really careful. Now, I, I say this because it's something that I see frequently uh, from students, particularly undergrad students, and I also see it depressingly on television. Now, you might be familiar with a programme called The Apprentice. Now, I know in America, The Apprentice, that's where it started, and that's where Donald Trump became a, a TV star. Um, so The Apprentice, for those of you who don't know it, so it, it's, it's something like Donald Trump. In the UK, it's Alan Sugar, who was a successful businessman. And he gets a bunch of young people together and he gives them missions to do each week to basically earn money by doing something. Uh, and a few years ago, I was watching, I always watch The Apprentice. I don't, it really frustrates me, but I, I can't resist watching it. And I forget what the product was, but the um, one of the teams had devised a product and they said, right, we'll go and do some market research. So they went out into the streets with a camera crew, I think it was a food product, and they said to people, you know, what do you think of this? And they asked three people, and they came back to the boardroom, and they did a presentation to Lord Sugar, and uh, they said, yeah, our market research proved that our product is, uh, is going to be successful. And Alan Sugar said, well, that's only three people, and two of them said they liked it, one of them said they didn't. Now, the key point was, they didn't ask enough people. So if you only ask three people, or even 30 for that matter, that is not representative of the UK population. Now this technique, and you see it all the time, like the photograph there with the journalist in the bottom, bottom right, you see this frequently on the BBC and other broadcasters, and they go out into the streets and they shove a microphone under somebody's nose and they ask them what they think about it. They might ask two, three, four, five people. It's called Vox Populi, which, or abbreviated to Vox Pop, 
and it's very very common in journalism and it should be done with great care although saying that a lot of journalists don't you do it with great care they see it as a definitive statement about public opinion so vox populi literally means the voice of the majority the voice of the majority and this is where it gets distorted because people often believe it means the popular voice which is what it suggests but it's actually the voice of the majority and it's not it is the popular voice but it's only some popular voice so please don't do vox populi three or four people and then write in your research this proves that the britain thinks this this proves that britain's racist for example because you've spoken to three people who are a bit uncomfortable about immigration that doesn't prove that britain's racist at all and the next point friend, friends and family are not representative of the uk population so typically with undergrads if they're left to their own devices and they, they do uh, surveys, they will go and speak to their boyfriend, their mum, their dad, their sister, their cousin, their next door neighbour. And they will say, this proves that British people are... Well, it doesn't. Your mates and your family, no disrespect to them, but they do not represent the UK population. Now, many years ago, I was told by my, uh, my supervisor, my PhD supervisor, because I was thinking about doing a survey, and he told me all of the above, what I've just told you, but he also told me one more thing. He said to make sure that if you're going to do a survey, the magic number is 600, 600. And he explained to me theoretically why that is relevant. So any less than 600, and it's not really representative, you can't make any big statements, any judgments. You notice recently with the, the trials for the vaccine, I was reading this morning about the COVID vaccine, 43,000 people. If they tested it on three people, there wouldn't be a huge amount of confidence about it. This is serious scientific stuff. The bigger the sample, the more accurate the result's going to be. 43,000 people they tested it on. So 600 people for surveys. <coughs> and also, for any of you who watch uh, commercial television, you'll notice hair care products, not something I watch a lot of adverts about, but if you notice hair care products, 30, you know, 87% um, of women said that L'Oreal makes their hair shiny and glossy. 87% and you look at the bottom it says survey sample 84 people 34 people that's not big enough it needs to be 600 for it to be significant it needs to be 600 and the way around this because obviously you don't have time and energy and it will cost a lot of money actually to do a survey of 600 people you don't have it so you've got use existing data if you can and there's loads slide number 48 there are loads of surveys and opinion polls online freely available done by professional organizations um, so if possible, use these organisations. Don't do your own surveys because you don't have the time, the energy and the money. Uh, so top left, there's a great organisation called YouGov. Uh, so go along to their website and there's a huge choice of questions and they've done the work already and they will explain their findings. Um, comrades at the bottom and then on the right hand side, British Social Attitudes. British Social Attitudes are really good <coughs> because they've been doing surveys over a long period of time. 50 60 70 years and it's actually quite hard if you ever get depressed about the world compare attitudes now for example 2020 to attitudes 50 years ago about immigration about uh, um, lgbt rights lgbt rights an enormous issue 50 years ago it's frightening to see how many people believe that it was completely unacceptable so things have actually moved on if you ever need a boost the world is actually getting better folks believe it or not believe it or not we take this three steps forward, two steps back sometimes, but look at British social attitudes. We are actually becoming more tolerant, believe it or not. Don't take my word for it. Look at the British social attitudes. You can always find somebody who's less tolerant, especially if you hang out on Facebook or Twitter. <coughs> There's always, as I said before, before, there is a quite a large number of idiots in the world who will say sexist, racist, homophobic things. It doesn't mean that that's typical. And if you look at British social attitudes, I personally think that the world is getting a slightly better place because things are improving. So let me just finish off. And again, we've gone over time slightly. Um, something else that you might want to look at um, with um, audience research is what's called audience effects. Audience effects. And I'm going to use a bit of the terminology that the academics use here. Um, so audience effects is, in other words, what is the impact of journalism? What is the impact of media? So what impact does a film have on people? Now, the, the, uh, the key point here, please don't assume that just because there's a, an article or a book or a film that says a certain thing that people automatically believe it. 
don't but please don't assume that that's true it might be true but don't assume that it's true so think about that simple relationship that I've got up there on the screen on slide 49 the journalist produces the news and then the audience consumes the news okay so what is the effect of that news that information that goes into the audience's brain well next slide it's not quite as simple as that and again academic words here so what happens is these are the academic words a journalist takes an event for example do you remember this story from a few weeks ago this story on the sun about asylum seekers apparently barbecuing the queen's swans so the journalist gets the original information from somewhere and he or she will encode it that's what the word is encoded in other words he or she will create a story using those building blocks from uh, the original source and then over the medium which is in this case the Sun newspaper it is then passed to the audience and the audience decodes it so the journalist makes sense of a story by packaging it up passes it over the media and then the audience receives it and it's a bit like unwrapping a Christmas present so the audience will actually make sense of it and that decoding is the important bit because don't assume that the audience believes every single word of it or interprets it in the way that the journalist intended and this is where audience research gets really really tricky <clears throat> because this is where people start to human beings start to demonstrate the nature of what it is to be human because we get react in different ways slide number 51 and I think I mentioned this previously for many 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 years academics and politicians and business people and journalists believed in this theory it's called the hypodermic needle theory so it was actually developed in the 20s and 30s and it's what's called a linear communication theory in other words it's a straight line between journalist and audience straight line like a railway line and the assumption is that the audience is passive the audience just sits there like a load of whatever <laughs> and they just absorb information and they believe everything and everybody in the audience the last point on this slide no individual difference so all the audience is the same and over the past 30 40 50 years this theory has been completely disproved but I still hear students sort of hinting that they believe this you know that if the journalist if journalists say something then the audience automatically believes it unquestioningly believes it and all of the audience are the same and there's no difference and the audience don't get involved and it's completely not true so you'll be pleased to know slide 50 52 put a big red cross through the hypodermic needle theory audience research has demonstrated that that is not relevant at all so and, and, and also if you find yourself going down that track folks please just correct yourself because you know that you as an audience member are more selective than this theory suggests and hence other people are more selective and slightly more intelligent than the, than the theory suggests I mean some people believe anything I was watching last night a documentary um, about conspiracy theories and there's this guy I'm sure Taylor knows this guy Alex Jones in the States he, he's uh, he, he has a website called Infowars and my goodness my goodness some of the stuff that that guy comes out with and people believe it people believe it but check it out folks so maybe depressingly for some people the the hypo thanks Taylor I'm glad you think he's crazy as well it's not just me um, and if you don't believe me about the difference in audiences next slide 53 for those of you in the UK you'll probably know and maybe even love this program called Gogglebox I think there's something similar in the States as well right Taylor and maybe other countries as well so Gogglebox for those of you who don't know is a program that looks at audiences watching television so the camera is pointed at the audience and I forget the name of are they called the Malone family in Manchester this group here with the two big dogs uh, so this family in Manchester there's four of them mum dad and two boys two sons and so you can the program shows them thanks Kate the program shows them watching TV and then it sort of flashes back to watch they're watching on TV and what you'll notice is sometimes all four of them agree that this program is rubbish or it's great or whatever sometimes they will disagree and then this family the Malone family might disagree with another family another family Siddiqui family in Derby they might disagree they might see it in a different way to the Malone family and the Mal sometimes they agree and, and this is the point about audiences there's no such thing as a homogenous audience even within the same family 
even within the same age groups, those two boys, they're about the same age, they often disagree. You know, so audience research, just be aware. It's fascinating stuff. Drop the hypodermic needle theory, unless maybe it's InfoWars with Alex Jones. Um, but And also look at the data and, 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 and the surveys that have been done already. So audience theories is going, for going on to the final slide, 54. Audience research, potentially fascinating stuff, potentially fascinating stuff. I've never really done any myself. I've read a lot about it. Um, it's, it's good for students because you can interact with um, people and understand how their minds operate and so on. It's, it's good if you're interested in people, which I hope you are. Uh, but just take care with it. So just a quick summary. There are many different sub-audiences based on age, class, gender, location, I guess. All these different ways that you can income, the ways that you can divide people. Key point, as we've just seen, people pay attention to what they read and hear and listen to and watch sometimes. Hypodermic syringe has been demolished. It doesn't really exist. Although saying that, when you start thinking about Alex Jones and Infowars, maybe some people still are susceptible to the hypodermic syringe. Something else as well, which audience research has discovered over the years, is that people consume news that cons confirms their belief, typically. So people who read the Daily Mail, they read it because the Daily Mail basically tells them every day that what they believe is correct. You know, so this idea that people read stuff that challenges them, it's, it's a bit of a fallacy, really. Unfortunately, people don't read stuff that challenges their views. They tend to read stuff that they believe. And the other irony, the last point, only 25% of people trust journalists, but we still watch and read news. And to me, this is a, the, one of the world's greatest ironies. As it says, surveys have shown that only a quarter of us actually believe what journalists tell us. And yet, somehow, ironically, because we are such stupid human beings, we still read the news. So we're believe, reading stuff that we a quarter of us don't believe. And the key point at the bottom is uh, that when it comes down to it, at the end of the day, people are complex and unpredictable. And we're all different, and yet we're all the same. This is where it gets really deep and philosophical. But we are all different, and yet we're all humanity. If you want to say it, we're all children of God, however you want to express it. We're all the same, but we're all different. And that's one of those conundrums which social scientists have been dealing with and trying to unpick for many years, and I'm sure we will for many more years to come. So we're complex and unpredictable sometimes. Okay, that concludes today's um, mission, folks. I'm sorry for going over time. Does anybody have any questions, comments, thoughts?